Good afternoon, and thank you again for attending this meeting with Bob Dog today. Uh, thank you, Bob, for your presence here at EOI. Welcome to EOI. Welcome, everybody, to EOI, the first business school founded in Spain in 1955. Um, as I mentioned um, in a meeting before, uh, with a clear focus on entrepreneurship. And this is the reason why we have today, and we are very proud of uh, having today uh, Bob Dorf with all of us. I think it's a great opportunity to meet with a world-class expert in entrepreneurship, and this new methodology, which is the lean startup and customer development, agile, for a business school like EOI is uh, is a great day. It's a very, very great day. And I think it's a great day for our students. It's a, a great day for our alumni, and it's a, a very nice opportunity to meet uh, to meet Bob today here with us. Um, the session is going to, to be with a first explanation by Bob Dorf, five, ten minutes or more. Then Alberto, who translates, is the, the main responsible for the translation of the, of the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, have, he has some, some questions. And then uh, I hope that many of you have questions for Bob hmm, about lean startup, entrepreneurship, well, is all of this, this kind of things. Thank you very much for, for being here again. Welcome also for the people who is following us on, on a streaming. Um, enjoy the session. Thank you, Bob, again. A very great experience. Thank right. you. So, uh, good evening. Um, it's been a great experience for me too. Meeting. Uh, it's on. Says it's on. Yep. Are we happy? Yeah, okay. So it's been tech, as they say, technology is wonderful when it works. Right? But um, it's just been delightful getting to know several of the. The professors here and uh, the leadership and uh, meeting some of the students, alumni. Uh, it's been a wonderful day for me as well. And it's really uh, been, I think when I, I sort of signed on to spend two years of almost round the clock working with uh, Steve Blank on this uh, book that was clearly his vision and uh, our mutual uh, sweat and blood, um, I didn't realize, uh, you know, the impact it would have all over the world. And I'm very pleased that at last uh, uh, it's available to uh, uh, Spanish and Latin American entrepreneurs uh, wherever they're found. I've actually probably spent uh, other than the U.S., I have certainly spent more time working with uh, entrepreneurs and corporate innovators in Latin America than any place else on the planet. I, I think I have uh, 30 Colombian stamps in my passport and eight or ten Mexican and a few other assorted other countries. Um, and it's a pleasure to see this... Uh, methodology taking hold in many, many corners of the world. Uh, and just, uh, I should also point out that it, uh, the book is being translated right now into uh, about 12 languages. It's already been published in nine, I think is the actual number, uh, China, Japan, Russia, France, uh, Polish, and so on. And thanks to the hard volunteer work of this uh, wonderful entrepreneur, Alberto Peralta, it finally has made it to the language where it's likely the most popular methodology. Uh, 
So on behalf of uh, Spanish-speaking entrepreneurs everywhere, I think we all owe you a uh, great debt of gratitude. Um, um, so what, what can I say in, I think I've probably already used my allocated five minutes, but basically in a few minutes to give you just a brief sense of this lean or customer development uh, methodology and how different it is from uh, the way we've been building startups for hundreds of years. The, the, if you, next week I'll be in Moscow where the way you build a company is you lock yourself in a room and you start writing code. And when you are sure that your product is done, you unlock the door you go out and you try and sell it and market it. And you being a, you know, engineer from one of the many fine engineering schools in Russia, you're sure you knew exactly what your customer wanted, what their problem was, how you were going to solve it, what the features of your product would be, what they'd pay for it, and where they'd buy it. And more often than not, not just in Russia, but anywhere in the world, we have sadly come to learn that that's not quite the way life works because customers don't read our business plan that says exactly what's going to happen with uh, ridiculous uh, certainty. And so the customer development methodology, which is really, I'm a newcomer to this methodology, have only working on it now for about five years. Steve Blank really developed it back in 2001, two, and three, when he was sure there was a better way to give startups a chance to succeed. And that way was to make most, if not all of your decisions and all of your product design activity built on feedback from the only people whose opinions matter, not your professors, not your investors, not your advisors, not your wife or husband, but the only people who are going to give you money for your idea, your customers. And so Steve, in his first book in 2003, proposed that from the day you begin building your prototype or writing your first line of code or designing your landing page, from that first day in business, you go out and you solicit feedback from your customers, not just on your product, but on your marketing, on your advertising, on your pricing, on your choice of partners and channels and things like that. So that by the time you have finished building the product, you've also gathered all this learning from your customers and in real time, driven it down into the product, into the marketing, into all aspects of the business, so that when you're done with the product, you're also done with the build business planning, and you have tested the way to get your customers, tested the pricing, tested the distribution methods, and all of that, and proven whether they work or not. Most of the time, they don't work. Most of the time, your first idea is dumb or not successful or nowhere near optimally successful. And as entrepreneurs, we hate to acknowledge that. But the sooner you learn that your idea is dumb, the sooner you can fix it. The sooner you fix it, the sooner you'll find the next dumb idea in your startup and you'll fix that one too. So that by the time you are ready to launch, you are launching a well-rehearsed, well-practiced, well-refined business idea. And um, Steve and I sort of love to joke about this book as uh, between its covers, you will find 500 of the stupidest startup mistakes there have been made in America. And either he or I has made every one of them personally and suffered the consequences. Between us, Steve has been involved in eight startups. I founded seven startups. He's invested in another 50. I've invested in another 27. 
you make a lot of mistakes and you learn a lot. And do, you know, this is not a pitch to buy our book, but it is a lot less painful to read about those mistakes than to make them. And more than a few of mine have had million dollar price tags, have destroyed companies, uh, and I hope that doesn't happen to you. So my personal sort of credential for being here today, this wonderful university or business school, is I've personally founded seven companies, the first at the age of 22. Two of them were substantial home run, you know, multi-million dollar returns on virtually no investment, all without venture capital. Two of them were modest successes, and three of them were what I lovingly call DTT investment or learning experiences. DTT is direct to the toilet. Um, and in my 27 investments, seven IPOs and six more DTT investments. The reason those DTTs are so important is when you have an IPO or two or seven, you spend all your time telling yourself how smart and what a visionary and how brilliant, and what a great executive and execution guy you are or lady. But when you have a million dollar failure, not fortunately they weren't all million dollars, when you have a significant failure, you spend a lot of time thinking about what should I have done? What did I do wrong? What will I do better next time? And the more of those lessons you can learn by listening to them or reading about them as opposed to personal experience, I assure you, uh, you know, the more, the better your chances for success. I think the last thing I would say is your chances for success are not that great. The thing we forget about at conferences like these is the very, very high failure rate of startups. In the US, it's somewhere in the 96, 97% range. Startups that are going for scalability, for IPO, for big, big bucks, fail 96, 97, 98% of the time, depending on whose statistics you want to believe. So if you are doing this, if you are choosing to launch a startup, choosing a career in startups, please don't do it because you're sure it's going to get you rich. There are lots of other reasons to be a founder of a startup. It's challenging. It's exciting. There's risk. There's the potential for reward. You're going to work intensely with intense, passionate people. Learn a lot. Learn it quickly. And probably not on your first or second startup, but maybe on your third or fourth, um, that learning will pay off in economic reward. But if you are only doing it for the economic reward and not doing it for the thrill, for the challenge, it will be very hard to get through the many sort of dark days that are a part of life in every startup. Now, you're not going to translate that. Right? No. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you have some questions? Yeah, well, uh, my, my first question would be uh, basically what would be your, your take on, I mean, if an entrepreneur is considering either the traditional way of building a company or uh, the customer development uh, way of doing it, or lean startup, uh, why would they choose uh, lean startup? I mean, they, they don't know either. So uh, why is it that they uh, well, choose uh, lean startup? Well, I, um, first, I think fewer and fewer entrepreneurs are choosing the traditional method because step one in the traditional method is find an investor who will put a million or two or three million dollars behind your uh, unproven new idea. And as rare as those investors are to find in Silicon Valley, they are even 
harder to find in Spain or Europe or Latin America. And so when we were cranking out, you know, almost the startup of the month in 1998, 99, in my sort of specialty uh, marketing services, um, you could find an investor to fund almost anything. Um, a couple of million dollars for a couple of bright people with a pretty good idea. If you had a pretty enough PowerPoint and you dressed nicely enough, you could get it funded. The, those days are gone forever. So that's reason number one why an entrepreneur needs to consider lean, because now the first thing an investor wants to see is not a pretty PowerPoint, not a beautiful, nicely bound business plan. They want to see traction. They want to see customer enthusiasm, customer interest, something that takes some of the risk out of the investment for the investor. Um, and I think the, the other reason is if we acknowledge that so many startups will, will fail, using lean, you can fail a lot faster and either go back and fix the startup you've been working on and try again or do something entirely new. But you save months and months, if not years. We just finished a program uh, for a company in New Jersey where the one of the most interesting comments was, we started with three ideas, killed one of them, the other two are still going. Wow, we got this far in 120 days. This is two years of work. That's a huge improvement in your investment as an entrepreneur that you have another, whatever that is, uh, 21 months to try again. There's it seems like there is a there is a, um, a point in many of entrepreneurs and even entrepreneurs that are here sitting here and watching us. You saying that um, the uh, the first idea that you have probably is going to fail, uh, but everybody here believes that they are not going to fail, uh, and that is I mean they have a point. Uh, you saying that you are going to fail. Um, and the methodology is based on uh, sex, I mean, uh, continuous failure until you reach uh, success. How do you um, address them? Well, I guess first I say that, that failure is even more difficult in the Spanish culture than uh, I mean, in the Silicon Valley culture. The definition of a failed entrepreneur is experienced. In other words, they, they almost celebrate failure in Silicon Valley as long as the entrepreneurs learn from that failure. Um, so here, I think you have to be comfortable with, call it, small failures uh, and make that part of the culture in order to give yourself permission to sort of fail forward, fail and and move forward. Um, and maybe some of it is the definition of the word failure. You're not, you know, uh, you know, you haven't closed the company, you haven't gone out of business or anything like that. But you have to really uh, be looking for failure points in your business idea, not just your product, but your pricing strategy or your channel strategy or your marketing strategy. The place where most entrepreneurs fail the most is in uh, the business model canvas box called customer relationships. How am I going to get my customer? Everybody says, oh, that's easy. Viral marketing, Facebook, uh, maybe Google AdWords, how about banner ads? And so you say, okay, that's what I'm gonna do, banner ads, I'm gonna spend $20,000, good. I've got my marketing figured out. Why would you spend $50,000 when you could test it for $50 and see that banner ads don't work? And that if you are great at banner advertising on the internet, 
For every 10,000 ads you show, you'll get two clicks. Um, two clicks is not two customers. It's two people who come and spend seven seconds on your homepage, and usually it takes a hundred of those people till you get an order. Why not experiment with that in the very first days of your company so that when you are ready to start spending money, you have a high degree of confidence that that money is going to perform for you and your investors. And what you're doing for yourself and for your investors is you're taking risk out of the startup. You think of the definition of startup success as an algorithm that's about this long, all you can do to improve the odds for you and your investor is take some of the dozens and dozens of failure points out of the algorithm. And now it's only this long. And the more you can do that, the more likely you are to find an investor, and the more likely you are to be successful. But some of them you can never remove. Like you're in the database software business and you've invented this really brilliant, wonderful new mini micro super duper database and you're ready to launch and on Monday Oracle announces the same thing. You are dead. It is just over. 5,000 salespeople on high commission that would eat their firstborn to get an order and you're a startup, so you can only control so much. And the more you assert yourself to reduce the risk, the more you improve the chances of success. Customer development, in a way, um, puts everything up front, meaning that um, when, when a normal entrepreneur or entrepreneur looks into a new business, probably he or she focuses on the areas of their ex expertise, uh, but forgets about the rest of the probably the components, the things that needs to be taken care of. But customer development puts everything up. Front. I mean, you have to take a look at everything, and that is a big swallow. Uh, I mean, requires a big swallow. Uh, Absolutely, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, often, that courage is respected by your investors if you are showing. Well, we, we were worried about this, but we also found we had this problem. And here's the fix for this one and the fix uh, for that one. Um, but the, the, you know, the list of challenges you face as an entrepreneur, there is none bigger than the challenge of keeping cash in the bank. And so the longer it takes you to find out about these failure points, the more likely you are to run out of cash. And if you run out of cash before you have traction, before you have customer momentum, then you probably need to uh, shut down your business. I don't know. I don't know if there is any question. If not, I keep on asking. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, I have one question. I've read the book of Lean Startup, and uh, the book says that uh, for the quality problems, if you find some problem, you should keep asking until five levels. So uh, if you launch some product which the quality is so bad that the, the user doesn't want to use them, how could you ensure that medium quality of the product is, is fine for to be launched? Is there any any and the and the sort of the quality that says if if we our product reach to this quality it will be it could be launched or not. Well, if I understand the question, I think the the idea of always asking why, right? What you're trying to do is to get your customer to write your business plan for you, not a little answer for every single customer but you're looking for patterns of feedback. I talked to 40 people, 15 of them said this, and these 15 
are the people I think are most likely to be my good customers. So I'm going to make this change in my pricing model or my uh, feature set based on um, what I've heard. But you are not looking for, uh, yeah, that's okay, yeah, that's good, yeah, that's nice. You are looking for dramatic enthusiasm for what it is you're doing. You're looking for customers who try to grab that non-working prototype out of your hands because they are so desperate to solve the problem your product solves. That is really hard to do. And the only thing that's harder to do is for the entrepreneur to say to herself, we are not getting the level of enthusiasm we need. Let's go back and think about what we can change in the product, in the pricing, in the distribution. What can we change to get customers more enthusiastic about this? Instead of charging $40 for the product, should we charge $3 a month? Instead of renting demos, should we give a free 30-day trial? Um, should we add that set of features because we've now heard about it from enough customers to suggest that it, you know, it might very well make a big difference. You need to get in your startup to what is knowingly called product market fit. I have this product. I think it sells to customers who look like this. And when I show this product to those customers, they grab it from me. They love it. They're excited about it. It's very, very hard to do. And it's very, very hard to acknowledge that you're not there and you've got to go back to the business model and think about how to make it stronger. But the more you invest in making it stronger early, the better your chances of success and the better your chances of building a really successful, scalable, sustainable business. Thanks. Anybody else? A couple down front. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm just reading uh, the Lean Startup book uh -huh. just now, and uh, it seems as uh, that the book um, speaks about common sense, just common absolutely. sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, All yeah. you have to do is do it. Like it's common sense not to walk on a stove, but you have to not do it to not, yeah. Yeah, yep. okay, and uh, spend as less effort as, as you can, and uh, do little steps uh, that you can uh, measure and, uh, okay. So the question is, uh, if this is a kind of a common sense, why do you think we have been touting every business school in the world for centuries? We have been applying for centuries the pipeline way of doing business instead of this kind of common okay. sense. And, and yeah, it's a it great question. That, it's a very good question. So let me give you the, the, the uh, I think, a pretty straightforward answer. First of all, Really, the, uh, this teaching began in 1908 when Harvard University gave the first Master of Business Administration degree, recognizing that national and global corporations were beginning to emerge and they needed a curriculum to train the leaders of those corporations in how to run you know, operations, finance, marketing, et cetera, all the normal things that you learn in business school. And so coming into the modern age, those were the people who were the, call them business experts, the MBA. And everybody up until really early, you know, 2000s, assumed that a startup was just a smaller version of a big company. And so you managed it exactly the same way on quarter to quarter revenue, on headcount, 
on operating efficiency, on gross margin, and so forth. And nobody really realized, and I think this is more than anything, Steve Blank's greatest contribution to the startup field, and by the way, one of his contributions was teaching Eric Reese what customer development and lean was when Eric was a student in Steve's class back in 2001. Um, but Steve's key contribution was pointing out the, the two differences between a startup and an established company. One is startup is not the smaller version of a of an existing company. And the other is on the day a startup is born, it knows nothing. It knows nothing about its customers because by definition, at nine o'clock on the morning, your first day as a startup, you can't have any customers just automatically. So how could you know what your customers want, what their problems are, and how to solve them if you don't have any? And so a, he, Steve, redefined the, the, may, the mission of a startup, right? A established company knows its customers, knows its products, knows its competitors, knows its channels, its partners, knows lots of facts. Right? A startup basically knows nothing. And if it's honest and admits that, then its role in life is to search for the right working elements of its business model and to search by testing each one of them with customers. So I think those are the two sort of underlying principles of customer development and, if you will, the difference between the new way and the old way, to acknowledge that you can't build this based on you know, assumed facts because there aren't really any. So this is not applying to established companies? Uh, not in the same ways, because established companies know, I mean, know lots of things about markets they're already in. If they're going into a totally new market, then the, the same rules apply. But, um, I mean, typically established companies innovate because they know what three competitors are doing in a space and they know that their product is weak in that space so they launch a different or an improved product or a new line of products but they're doing that based on a bunch of facts startups don't have access to those facts so basically you're saying you're calling innovation um, a new business model not just a technological uh, fact or whatever Right. It, yeah, I think the thing entrepreneurs love to forget is that a successful startup is not just a great product. You need a marketing strategy, you need a pricing strategy, you need a channel strategy, a partner strategy, a cost structure that's manageable, you need scalability, lots of other things that you should be thinking about on day one, not on launch day. This one right in the front. What? Fine. No. Nope. Thank you. And one question. Based on your experience, uh, what do you think is um, easier to learn from? From success or from failures? Uh, I mean, you know, there are some people that say that we have to learn from success because we make money out of the things that we do well. But other people say that we spend and waste our money out of the things we do wrong. So based on your experience, what do you think is uh, more inspireful uh, for new startups? Uh, past failures or past successes? Thank you. I'm not sure I have a great, um... is that me? No, oh, great sort of scientific answer for you. My personal sort of my instinct is much. You learn much more from your failures because you pay much closer attention. 
You're not drowning in champagne or celebration or whatever. And you, if you're truly an entrepreneur, you are eager to get something out of that failure. Uh, and you typically will spend more time sort of diagnosing the, the outcome, I think. Uh, um, and I, mean, I've, I have had more than a few, uh, uh, it's usually the last check a company writes when it fails is the bill for the sort of post-mortem dinner which is always in a very expensive restaurant with very good wine and lots of alcohol. And for an hour, you try to make a list of the 10 stupid things we did along the way. Um, uh, and I've, I've been to my share of those dinners. But um, I think it you know it depends on the... Uh, um, you know, I think on, on the team and, it, you know, I think you, if the team is going forward to do something else together, I think their the learning from the failure is even more powerful. But, um, but I'm, I'm not sure I have a really great, great answer to difficult, difficult question. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you, Bob, for being here, just to allow us to ask you things. I'm Agustin, I'm founder of Enviro.com. It's the first environmental platform for professionals in Spain and Latin America. And uh, the thing is, I would like to ask you how you think, just to ask you something and to invite you for something. I uh, ask you about the, how do you think we could integrate the environmental sustainability in the lean startup, not only the economic sustainability, but the environmental one. And the other one is, I, I'm sure you know about the Startup Weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, founded the initiative greenweekend.org, and I would invite you to bring it to the United States to talk about it to Eric Rice, and I, I, I will be very happy if you found it in the United States. So. The answer you give me, I will translate to the to the entrepreneurs in our green weekends. Well, first, um, rather, I mean, I love Eric Reese. He's a wonderful, brilliant guy. But I'd much rather introduce Green Weekend to Mark Nager, the fountain Nager, the founder of Startup Weekend, who is eager to find new important things for entrepreneurs to do, and that could very well be one. Um, my probably biggest uh, consulting client uh, pays me a, a, for a wonderful, wonderful rate of one Diet Coke per hour of work. Um, and it's a $2 billion social venture fund called the Acumen Fund. And the Acumen Fund uses venture capital where the investors want no money back. What they want is sustainable businesses that improve life in underprivileged countries. So it's bringing fresh water to a small village in Africa or raw sewage out of the streets of India or getting income uh, and health benefits for rickshaw drivers, these kinds of businesses where their attitude is that Entrepreneurship is much more powerful force than charity. That if you just gave a pile of money to the Nairobi sewer authority, more of it would be lost to bureaucrats or inefficiency or carelessness or whatever than if you found a bunch of entrepreneurs and gave them the seed capital to do it. And so I coach these entrepreneurs on Skype calls all over the world, and in, I think I've, uh, the week I get back, I have a half day with them and when they're all together in New York. And um, the, it does a couple things. First, it convinces you of the power of entrepreneurship to do other things than just make money, which is a very lovely thing. And a, uh, they have a team of, I think, 24 people who live in the far corners of the world on almost no sal you know, miserable salary for a two-year contract, 
a hundred applications for every job. Every one of those miserable jobs living under a mosquito net in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa for two years for a thousand dollars a month. Great, great job. You know, looks very good on your resume and once the mosquito bites, uh, heal. And what we found is that quite a few of the pieces of the business model canvas and a lot of the thinking of traditional for-profit entrepreneurship apply. Tell me why it's in my interest as a customer to have a grass roof on my house instead of a shingle roof. Tell me why I should spend $4,000 or borrow $4,000 for solar energy when it's going to take 14 years to break even. Customer motivation is as powerful in those situations as it is in should I buy this new computer game or, you know, mobile phone or whatever. And sometimes the sort of boxes on the business model canvas apply just perfectly, and sometimes they don't. For example, customer acquisition, uh, sometimes you either can't spend money on customer acquisition or your customer acquisition is regulated. So the village elders tell you, sure, you could bring fresh water here, but everybody has to have access to it or you're not welcome. Okay, there's a box on the canvas. Don't need to think about it. Um, the, you know, uh, one of the programs we were working on was uh, um, solar powered lanterns so that kids in, you know, in villages without electricity could work in the fields till dark and still do their homework. But nobody can afford the lantern. So we worked on the revenue model, the cost or the revenue box and came up with a pay by the week plan administered through the parents at the school where you paid 15 or 18 cents a week until you paid for, for your lamp. So a lot of the, the see, it's amazing to me how many of the principles apply even when you remove uh, profit. And uh, so, I don't know, I guess that's the, that's the long, short answer. Hmm? Uh, yeah. I guess it's my turn. Uh, hello, Mr. Dorf. It's nice to have you here. And uh, I would like uh, I would like to place a couple of questions. Uh, sure. The first one is uh, regarding the the failures that uh, don't look so good on a curriculum. You know, because uh, we, you, we have, you've talked a little bit about the failure culture in Spain and, and the United States and differences. What well, in Silicon Valley specifically? Uh, so I would like to know if there is any uh, failure that doesn't look that good in a curriculum, in, even in Silicon Valley. And, uh, in a career? In, yeah, in an entrepreneur uh, career, oh. let's say. Uh, in the sense of, of uh, being able to put it forward to an investor and uh, he will take a look at it and say, oh, this is not good. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, the second question, may I, may I place it right now? Well, let me can, say, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a, a great answer to the first one. I think, or the only answer I can sort of think about is you did something really stupid or immoral or illegal. Uh, uh, you know, in other words, if you launched your product today and Microsoft launched the same thing tomorrow, I don't think that hurts your career, even though it ended your, your business in all likelihood. Um, and I remember having this discussion with my father when I told him I was quitting my really great job to start my first company and he was rather unhappy. And he, uh, rather unhappy is a big understatement. Uh, 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 he was very happy at the party to celebrate the exit. But, um, uh, and he said, you know, what's gonna happen if you fail? And I said, I think it looks really good on a resume for a 22 year old to have started a company, tried it for a year and it didn't work. So I'm going back to get another job. And it didn't make him happy when I started the company and I never went back and you know, I didn't have another job for the rest of my life. Basically. And 
So I, I, I think we also forget two, two things that you lead me to. One is entrepreneurship is not for everyone. It is hard. You give up a lot of your personal life, of your social life, of your downtime. Your, if you are a diligent entrepreneur, you're thinking about your company in the shower in the morning. And when you put your head on the pillow at night, even if there's a very good looking head on the pillow right next to you, and you sacrifice a great deal. It is not for everyone. And if it's not for you, it doesn't make you a bad person or a bad employee or anything like that. So, so that's part one. Part two is if you take some entrepreneurship courses or you spend a year as an entrepreneur um, and you decide that it's not for you, you have probably learned some very good skills that will serve you working at Santander or the world's largest bank about how to make decisions with imp sometimes imperfect data, about how to remove or climb over obstacles, about how to think smart and fast, how to learn from colleagues. Those work anywhere. So, I, so. Well, thank you. Uh, so the second question is uh, deals with the, 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 the field in which uh, lean development is more likely to be applied. From the text, uh, uh, the text I've read uh, since now, uh, it, it looks like uh, lean development comes from uh, services or products that, are, that deal with the internet, either as a platform, as a distribution channel, or as a way of providing services and so on. So I would like to hear some success uh, stories, if, if if any, <laughs> of companies which uh, have applied uh, lean development and customer development, uh, customer development in uh, in other fields in, in sure. dealing with thinking. Right, right. I mean, the easiest way to think about this is the spectrum. The easiest company to do, in in fact, we were joking about this uh, at lunch. E very easiest company to do agile or lean development is basically consulting. Oh, you don't want consulting on this? Give me an hour, I'll change the PowerPoint, I'll give you consulting on that, right? You can shape your product to the customer with a few strokes of the key. You move from that, you go to websites and sort of, uh, you know, smartphone apps. Again, you can change almost anything overnight. Then you go to sort of personal software. Again, you can change anything in a day or two or three then enterprise software a week or two or three. Now over here, jet engines, construction equipment, uh, things like that where the change can take years and cost millions. So you need to be changing in the sort of design phase and getting the feedback to blueprints and sketches and performance specifications, not to the physical product. But the most difficult of all are in the life sciences area. You're trying to develop a new bionic knee that knows exactly when to bend and will let me with the, you know, a electronic knee walk as well as anybody else. Uh, and with that, uh, the sort of simpler even example is uh, pharmaceuticals where if you can develop the pill to cure, pick your kind of cancer, um, you know how many customers you'll have. You'll know with a little bit of research how much the insurance company would pay or the government would pay for somebody to take that pill. So you'll know what your market size is and you'll know that if you cure liver cancer, everybody will buy your pill. Right, everybody who has it, and there's 272,000 of them a year, whatever. There, your risk is not customer risk. It's entirely innovation or, you know, in, you know, invention risk. And uh, so very often when you change a complex physical product, you are changing it based on... Um, 
uh, other elements of the business model. So simple example, a $60,000 industrial battery we worked on for a startup inside of General Electric. We found that the biggest improvement to their business was keeping the physical design spec fluid by allowing the container that held all the battery cells to be lots of different shapes and sizes. So it could fit under a bus, inside a crane, inside a, you know, a bulldozer, whatever. And we found the most responsive uh, results to other changes in the business model. A simple example, my probably favorite, uh, this battery is a sodium powered, powered long lasting, high powered battery that could power a cell phone tower for days. $60,000 each, you needed three of them for a large cell phone tower. We were talking to cell phone companies all over the world and they kept saying, takes us three or four years to make a decision to get something like that in the budget. We didn't have that kind of time. We were a startup, even though we're owned by GE. We changed the revenue model from buy our battery for $60,000 to rent it for $600 a month. And we took the expense out of the capital budget and into the operating budget and nice pile of purchase orders. Three-year-old business going to do $83 million this year unless it gets lucky and does more. Simple change from customer feedback. Uh, another one, uh, not our idea, we worked on it after the company had the idea. Carvajal, $2 billion uh, company in uh, Colombia, um, makes a lot of its money in printing and publishing. Very difficult, declining industry as you, you know, their biggest publishing product was the yellow pages in all of South America. They get thinner by the year in every country, right? The people at Carvajal said, we own all of these uh, pulp and paper manufacturing mills. Our 100 year tradition in Colombia is we try to keep everybody employed. But every time we run these mills, we lose money. What else can we make in the mill? And somebody came up with the idea of instead of putting wood pulp into the mill and making typical paper, they put bagasse into the mill. This is the waste around a sugarcane stock. And they were able to make a different fiber paper that could take a light coating of plastic and could replace styrofoam in those hamburger clamshells, in coffee cups, things like that at the same price uh, and be 100% biodegradable. Where's our green dot co gentleman? You should like to invest in that business. Uh, from zero revenue two years ago, $17 million this year, and they have just put their toe in the water in how big this business is going to be. So there, there's a great example of physical constraint using different kind of creativity, but they the farther you go toward intense physical goods, the more difficult it gets, no question. No, just one practical question. Okay, in the methodology, you insist in, in interviewing the customers as, as, as early as you can. Okay, and in, in the problem that, that I'm finding is how to convince uh, potential customers to, to, to spend time with you, and if you have some tips about this, this kind of thing. Sure, great question, very important question. What the young lady is talking about the first step in the customer development process customer discovery, uh, where you, the founder, need to go out and conduct as many of these interviews as you possibly can, because the more times you personally get to look a customer in the eye, 
the smarter you will be when it comes to determining the validity of what other people tell you about customers are saying. You cannot use focus groups as focus groups generate sort of committee opinions. You cannot use surveys, or at least in our view of the world, because as we all know, you start to take an online survey at about the sixth question, every answer is a two or a three or a four, or it fits into a cute pattern, but you lose interest quickly unless somebody is sitting right across from you. And when somebody's sitting right across from you, they can see whether you're bored or really excited or somewhere in between. And that leads, so the rules are, you're never selling. You are always trying to have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation where you're giving that person some information about new innovations in running shoes, and they're telling you how much they run, what they like and don't like about running shoes, and this brand and that brand and whatever. So you're, you're educating them, they're educating you. The next rule is the customer is in charge. What you're trying to get to is the most relaxed, continuing discussion of your product, the subject area, the problem you're solving. And so you don't want to have a list of questions that you're going through the way a market research interviewer is. You let the customer take charge of the conversation. And the other, um, key rule is do not do this with family or friends. Your family or friends know that when you're coming to talk to them about your idea, you want them to tell you it's wonderful and it's brilliant. And of course they'll buy one. Just let them know as soon as it's ready. And so you want to use your family and friends to introduce you to people who will spend 20 minutes with you as a favor to them but won't be nice to you as a favor to them. They'll give you their honest feedback. And it's infinitely more powerful than, you know, family and friend uh, feedback. And then the other issue is um, business to business. Business to business interviews are much harder because you need to find people with subject matter expertise or experience dealing with or solving a particular problem. And uh, so there you need to call in all your favors, all your friends, accountants, professors, lawyers, anybody you can to find enough people who are knowledgeable about accounts payable or, you know, weed control or whatever it is you're working on. And their introduction should say, you know, Jose has studied weed control for three or four years. He's looking at some innovative products. He can tell you a lot about what's going on in the market. Would you spend 20 minutes with him? Because he wants to hear how you use weed control products and, you know, what you like and don't like and how you buy them and so forth. Which leads to the final rule, which is you are never selling. You are only having a conversation. And this is the hardest rule of all for entrepreneurs because we like to do stuff. We like to get orders. We even like to get our head kicked in so we can go home at night. How was your day, dear? Oh, I made 10 sales calls. The first nine, they beat the crap out of me. But that 10th one, I think I might get an order next year. I accomplished something. I'm an entrepreneur. And so these kinds of conversations give you a wealth of information, but sometimes not as much satisfaction until you get to the conversation where the customer says, well, gee, you know, I'm not really crazy about your product, but if it could add and subtract and divide and store the result in a database I think I would buy one for everybody in my company. Aha, there's an idea, there's an improvement. 
Now let me go test that idea on 10 or 20 more customers. And if I've just made my product on my company a lot more exciting to a whole bunch more people, all that hard work paid off. So. Bob, uh, just before, before you ask, um, in terms of the book, the book uh, speaks about uh, that very same thing. What are the, say, problems, uh, the top three problems that the book uh, can help anyone here solve um, like this one? I, I don't know if you can. There, I mean, I hope it can help people solve 50 or 100 of the problems people encounter in the life of their startup, uh, or maybe more than that because you will encounter so many. And what we sort of tried very hard to do, the way we, right, we talk about every startup has to um, have a customer archetype. In brief, a customer archetype is a drawing or a picture of who exactly is my dream ideal customer. Almost as if you were putting a picture up on the wall of the person you most want to marry if only you could find him or her. And you are always looking at that picture, especially before you go dancing or go to a party or whatever. And so Steve and I said, well, we said we ought to do this in the book. Let's do it for the book. Who is our dream date, our customer archetype? And we agreed fairly quickly that it was a 25-year-old engineer who had just gotten out of school a year or two, who knew how to build a product, but had no idea that that was only one-ninth or one-tenth of what made a successful company. And so the book says, okay, 25-year-old engineer, hold my hand. We're gonna take you on a guided tour of all the next steps from here, you know, please Lord to the IPO. Um, so, and one of my favorite uh, sections is a uh, section, I forget what chapter, but it's about website optimization. And the way we approached website optimization is we said, these are the six or five com most common questions we hear wherever we travel about website optimization. Question one, I built my website and it's live and nobody comes. What do I do? Try this, try this, try this, try this, try this, try this, try this. Question two, now they're coming, but they stay an average of seven seconds. Try this, try this, try this, try this, try this, try this. Next, they stay a minute but they don't click on anything. Try this, try this, try this. They click, but they don't give me their email. Another list. They give me their email, but nobody buys anything. And it's sort of, I guess, a good example of the way, you know, lots of you, I'm sure, especially you've been to school here, you know lots about business and marketing. But if you are purely an engineer with no, barely an understanding that there's a world around your code base and your computer, uh, we wanted to be that sort of uh, granular and that basic and uh, to, you know, and there's no guarantee that any of those lists of try this will make people uh, rush. All of a sudden you have thousands of customers after reading that chapter of the book, but hopefully it will you know, generate meaningful improvement from, you know, along the way. Yeah. Yes? How can you test pricing? Very simple. If, if a product like this were on the market, you know, what do you think you would be willing to pay for it? Where did you come to that number? What are you comparing it to? Okay, you do test pricing in step two of customer development, 
customer validation. Because at some point, every entrepreneur does want to start selling. And you can only spend so much of your life trying to optimize. So once you are convinced that you have an opportunity, then you have to see if it's a scalable opportunity. And so customer validation, step two, first coaches you in what selling materials you need and how to organize them and so forth. But then it basically, to summarize it in a few sentences, figure out the price you think you want to charge. Even if the product is nowhere near ready, instead of saying, how do you like it? Say, we will be shipping this product on January 2nd. We will only have 50 of them because that's as many as we are confident we'll be able to support with the installation and you know call center in the first month or two. You're telling me you like it. If, if you want to be one of those 50, sign here. You don't give me any money till it's installed on January 2nd and it does everything I said I'm gonna do and the price is X. And what it does is it makes your conversation with that cuz takes all the BS, I think that translates out of, all the BS out of the conversation with the customer. You told me you loved it, you thought it was great. This is a no risk offer for you. If, it's, if I deliver it and it does everything I said, then you pay me. So tell me why that you won't do that. It changes the dimension of the conversation dramatically and gets to it. Well, I'm worried that, you know, my boss won't approve it. It's really, I don't know if I have that in the budget. You know, you get past the first level uh, of excuses. From from my side, then um, uh, does customer development improve the possibilities of a business that is already running, that is uh, achieving some some traction, to become? Um, I mean, to to get some sustainable growth. I mean, it, it repeating, can, repeating it, yeah, the, yeah. the whole process again. Yeah. Um, the problem is a company that's, you know, in full operation mode very often can't stop everything for a long period of time and, and do this. And so what they have to do is sort of pull out a team and get them to go and particularly interview Customers who are clearly not happy or have left the company or bought but didn't install or installed but didn't use and try to bring all that learning back uh, and, and see what can be improved to strengthen the core product delivery and so on. Um, it, It, sometimes I guess people resist doing it because they're all caught up in, well, how am I going to make this week's numbers or, or that sort of thing. But uh, it has the potential to be quite powerful. Uh, I mean, there is almost never a bad time to be talking to your customers in almost any business on the planet. And so if you have a rigorous way of doing that and returning that feedback to Product or process improvement, you know, good for you. You said you mentioned earlier um, that uh, the hardest thing that you find within customer development is going backwards. Meaning, sure. uh, I don't know if you can, uh, because I think it was in a different audience. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can relate again to to that part, because I believe that what we um, in the traditional way are used to do is just go forward. Uh, no matter what, you keep on uh, um, insisting that sooner or later you're gonna, you're right. gonna uh, make it. Right, we all say to ourselves, I'm an entrepreneur, I solve problems. So nobody's buying it, 
that's my next problem to solve. I'll go figure out how to get people to buy it. <laughs> Usually that leads to buy two, get one free, or half price, or something, you know, something really productive, uh, great learning. Yeah. Um, and so, and big companies also, everybody's supposed to hit their plan, do their objectives, MBOs, whatever, and saying, wait, we need to stop, this isn't working, is, you know, one of the most difficult things to say in business, even more in an established business than a startup. Um, well, in startup I, in a start I think it's... In a startup, it's going to be the balance, I mean, the, 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 the bank balance. I mean, the, whenever you run out of money, you're done. Right. Because if not, I mean, from my experience, it's like uh, going over and over until you end up running out of uh, cash, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, if you look at the most recent ugly example, RIM, right? A few years ago, there was a board meeting at RIM. Oh my God, what is this, you know, iPhone thing? Oh, don't worry about it. Nobody's ever going to mix their music and their pictures with their business mail. Not a problem. It's a toy. A year or two later, geez, some people are buying it. Yeah, but it's not our customers. Who our customers won't type on a piece of glass? They want a keyboard. Uh, yeah, they've been saying that, and they're now, you know, on the edge of, I guess they've been saved from bankruptcy because they got bought for a few pennies, right? They stopped, they were too busy declaring victory to talk to their customers. I, I assume Zynga is a game company here, Facebook Games. Zynga went from about a $30 a share to about a $1.80 a share in almost no time when some of their games just all of a sudden uh, nobody was playing them anymore. Nobody noticed the gentle, gradual customer attrition till it was gone. They had one, they bought, uh, they bought it for $200 million. Three months later, there were almost no players. Uh, yeah. So staying in touch with your customers, as we say in the book, from the day you start until the day you either sell the company or close the doors, you need to have a mechanism for continuously processing that customer feedback. In fact, I was talking earlier about my seven startups. Uh, my best of seven where I met Steve Blank was CRM. How do you build mechanisms to stay in touch with your customers, to process that feedback, to learn from it, to do a better job making them happier and, and so on. I, I changed this update uh, for a while. Um, everything that the book says is based on a team, not just the uh, solo entrepreneur uh, that is used. Uh, so, I mean, uh, in, in here, probably in other parts of the, of, of the world, um, we think as an entrepreneur, as a um, solo person that goes there with his idea, her idea, and that uh, fights the odds against everybody. Uh, but you're advocating for a team that creates the, the company. Um, I don't know if you can uh, expand on that. Well, the sort of rule about... Uh, Founding teams in Silicon Valley is, ideally it's three, but it's a minimum of two. And the two are a hacker and a hustler. The hacker, the coder, the product person who only wants to talk to his or her computer, doesn't really like people very much. The hustler is the customer facing, the discovery person, the marketing person, the sales person. And so if you think about it, they meet over at the coffee pot every morning and the hustler says, here's what I learned from our customers yesterday. And the hacker says, okay, I can change that and change that. Those sound like good improvements. Then they go their separate ways for a day and they meet at coffee the next day and it creates a very powerful team. The third person that the Valley likes to look for is the artiste, the UI, UX person who interprets that conversation representing the customer and how would I want to see this and use it and so forth. 
And the chances of having all of those brain powers between a single pair of ears is almost zero, right? That is a lot, right? It's a left brain person and a right brain person. It's a vision person and a detail person. It's all the things that just don't go together. And so very rarely is a solo founder funded in the Valley. And the only place they, to me that they, where they seem to be left is in Moscow, where it's, I am a Russian engineer expert. This is my idea. I do not share. Um, and I have a big baseball bat and I try hard to convince them to think otherwise. And the pitch I give is, would you rather have 100% of a small pile of rubles or 50% of a huge pile of rubles? And, you know, uh, sometimes I win and most times I don't. Uh, but the other rules about founding team, no friends and particularly no girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse. Okay, why? Because some you, this I think this translates. Somebody's always got to be the asshole. Somebody's always got to make the hard decision. And if you're going home to sleep with your CTO and you're about to tell her that her weekend is ruined because you want her to pull out 250 lines of code and replace them with 400 new lines of code, you may not make that change and you better have a comfortable couch. So you want to always be able to, you know, and also no 50-50 equity, at least 51-49 and the guy, the nasty guy gets, or lady gets the 51. And I mean, I have seen this work over and over and over again. I have seen one successful husband and wife partnership where the wife was the CTO and the husband was everything else. And they were older and more mature and they were doing their startup out of love for the outdoors. It was, I only cost me a million dollars to see this movie, but uh, the it was a website for hikers, backpackers, canoe people, camping people, which they were passionate about. So they, they were tired of working on Wall Street, uh, and they worked beautifully together. In 42 years, it's the only one like that I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, um, so. Just, Are we exhausting these kind, gent gentle people? Or <laughs> you know? Just one question, because I've seen a couple of um, investors. Um, we haven't talked about funding. Right. Um, I don't know if you have, uh, I mean, the book uh, can book, help, obviously. The book does not talk about funding at all, because uh, funding, at least in our view of the world and in the current time and ec economy, both here and in the United States, funding only happens when traction happens. When the company is moving forward, finding investors is relatively easy. When the company is having, you know, I think I did a blog post on this recently. If you're growing 10 or 20% a month in dollars or users or average uh, minutes per user or some really powerful metric. And if you're doing that three or four or five months in a row, finding investors is easy. If everything is flat or worse, finding investors is impossible. In this scenario, it won't take you a ton of time to find an investor. In this scenario, you will waste more time than you have. So my personal Opinion. Also, my seven startups were all done without a dime of outside capital, not because I wouldn't have loved to have it, but when I was 22 years old, I didn't even realize it existed. And when I did my last one at 42 years or 43 years old, uh, my partner and I said we'd rather write our own check and not waste time talking to those people and it was a marketing services business. It didn't need a lot of money and it went 
you know, sort of like a rocket. Uh, so be careful. You can waste all of your time on trying to find investors. Better to invest that time in finding customers and using those customers to create a business that attracts investors uh, all by itself. Um, my last business was growing at about 75, 80% a year. Once a week, I would get a call from a you know, venture capitalist. Hi, are you looking for any money? You know, we really love to talk to you. We've been reading about you in the press. But once a week, when we finally decided, uh, which I actually voted against, we finally decided to take in venture capital. We had seven term sheets. It was 100%. The worst one was a $75 million pre-money. The best one was 150 pre-money. But when you have seven term sheets, you definitely, when you have three term sheets, you definitely have a deal. When you have seven, you just, you know, put them in a stack and, you know, whatever. And it wasn't you know, it was all wasn't about the management team. It was all about the traction and the continued record of quarter on quarter, every number going in the right direction. That's probably a great place to end because I wish that to all of you. It is the closest thing you can come to having sex with your clothes on to watch those numbers crank and crank and crank, and it's the only real measure of success for a startup in Spain or Silicon Valley or Moscow or anywhere in the world. Thank you very much. All right.